<coughs> okay, this will be the second video from Marginalia HQ here, down in the basement of where I live in Prague. And what I want to talk about is what I'm working on here, which is for the first issue of Marginalia, the communitarian creative Commons zine that I'm working on right now. Um, and I'm a little bit unsettled at the moment, and I'll tell you why. Um, I'm unsettled because I'm marginal, all right? So I'm economically marginal, I'm culturally and socially marginal. Um, and I'm saying this as somebody who is in some ways privileged because I am, as you see, um, a white male. I'm from Britain. Um, and that should give me um, according to the the structures that we see in society, um, that should mean that I'm kind of in many ways privileged, and I am in many ways privileged, and was in many ways privileged, kind of materially. Um, my parents worked very hard and um, had a reasonable amount of, of kind of economic success in their lives. They came over to Britain from um, Ireland in the 1960s, and in some ways that kind of worked for them in the ways that they would have expected at the time. Um, moving to somewhere that was economically much more successful than, than was Ireland at the time. They came from the west of Ireland, and there was very little there. Uh, where my dad came from in Donegal, um, the, the land was not very... It wasn't very productive, um, and there was very little else to do but work the land. Um, both of my parents come from kind of farming backgrounds, and um, my dad remembers a time that all of his father's sheep died on a hill, and that meant that there would be no money coming in. He remembers going around kind of asking the shops um, to supply them and his family with food on tick. Um, so that means kind of on credit um, because they didn't have any money coming in. So of course then they were very strongly motivated to succeed economically and did. Um, but I'm looking back over the period of, of when I was growing up and how I didn't manage to do that. Um, but now that I'm kind of facing a situation where all of my new family through my girlfriend um, here in Prague, um, they're looking at me and seeing, well, what is this guy doing? He's not working on anything. He's not earning any money. Um, he's not bringing any kind of money home. So I'm trying to explain all of the things that I explained to my parents when I was in Britain over many, many years. It was very difficult to do um, to do that, to explain, well, I, I have problems with depression I had. I had problems with autism and ADHD. And it took like, 20 years, really, of, of work to try to, to, to get across what that means. And also in Britain at the time, it took a, a long time to get any kind of official diagnosis. Um, I didn't seek help for depression when I should, perhaps. Maybe that's something that I should have done. But in your, when you're in that situation and the people around you don't understand what depression is and had never experienced it themselves, then it's very difficult for them to know. And um, I went to Catholic schools where everything was reinterpreted in a kind of... Um, I guess in a spiritual way, which is not entirely a wrong way to, to understand things, but um, in any case at the time, when I was growing up, I was born in December 1978, um, which was just before kind of Margaret Thatcher came to power, incidentally, which is not irrelevant, um, but people didn't know about neurodevelopmental conditions like ADHD and Asperger's syndrome at that time and I wasn't diagnosed in school. What that later would mean was that because I wasn't diagnosed at school, I couldn't be diagnosed in adulthood because it was almost a precondition of being diagnosed later um, because of the way the, the, the bureaucracy works, because of the way the funding structures work with the NHS. Um, it was very difficult then to get a diagnosis in adulthood and I secured that, I think it's called the Barbary Clinic, maybe it's not, um, in, 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 in Birmingham when I got first diagnosed with ADHD, and I've been diagnosed a number of times since. And um, I was treated in the, in the, in the typical way, uh, pharmacologically, that is, um, with kind of 
um, ADHD medic medication like uh, Ritalin, things like that. For a time, I took um, uh, lithium carbonate prophylaxis for um, for manic depression when I was at university, and um, and things like that. Now, I guess I've started a conversation with a student loan company, and I wonder whether this conversation can go anywhere, and I will maybe make some of that kind of uh, communication kind of public in a sense of just saying, look, this is the conversation I'm trying to have with the student loan people to see, uh, to, to describe to them how I've done everything I think that could have been expected of me to try to earn money, to try to build a career in some way. Um, and I'm looking at all of the ways I've tried to do that, essentially. I'm confronting that with the, um, the essay, which I'm trying to write at the moment, um, and that will be for my Ganalia issue zero, the first issue of the zine, uh, which will take as its theme neurodevelopment conditions, conditions um, and my experience of them, but also my experience of growing up in an area, the black country in, in, in the West Midlands in, in, in Great Britain. Uh, well, Stourbridge is kind of on the edge of the black country, or is not classed as the black country, but nevertheless, um, that is the kind of socio-economic context of, of, of um, my childhood. And what that meant in the 1990s under Tony Blair, whose government basically extended the Thatcher Revolution um, in Britain at that time, uh, with a couple of kind of modifications that were um, which moved it slightly towards an idea, a pre-existing idea of social democracy um, in, in Britain, but not by very much. And um, one of the first things they did was give um, the control of interest rates to the Bank of England rather than to have it um, controlled by the state in order to win acceptance from the, um, the economic orthodoxy of the time, which was um, built by the Thatcher Revolution. Uh, which borrowed many ideas from, from the way that the, um, the neo, neoliberal economics was applied in um, General Pinochet's Chile uh, at the time. And um, Thatcher was a big friend of General Pinochet and had tea with him famously at one point um, in her reign, and it was a reign. Now, so I'm looking back at, at, at being a kid now. Uh, my real name, my real surname is Ward. Uh, my brother grew up and he was called Wardy. Um, I was then called Wardo, which was how I was known pretty much exclusively for most of my early adulthood. And of course that was kind of uh, amusing to a lot of kids because they could call me Weirdo. Um, and I was weird, which is what you are when, when you don't know that you are ADHD or autistic and nobody knows that, and nobody knows what it means. Um, but I tried many ways to kind of um, to, to, to earn money, to build a career for myself. I was working at a shell carriage initially as a, as a car wash attendant, um, and then I went to university as, as good intelligent people should go to university and I, I, I worked up a lot of debt to do that and I struggled through university because um, I was just struggling socially, I was struggling with depression, I was struggling with all of the things that I didn't get understand uh, and wouldn't understand for a number of years. Um, the NHS kind of was slow, it was underfunded especially in terms of um, mental health, anything that comes under mental health as ADHD Asperger's syndrome does. Um, and then, what else did I try? I was, I've been a teacher here in the Czech Republic. I have taught English. I have taught Czech, indeed. Um, I have worked in schools, both in mainstream education, in um, international schools here. I've been a school librarian. I've been an assistant in an international school. I have worked as a landscape gardener. I have worked with uh, kids with neurodevelopmental conditions in, in, in Britain when when that was still being funded as, as today isn't kind of really being funded at all and the college I used to work at isn't really um, it's as existing as a rump of what it once was but essentially the, the, the Conservative government really has, has pulled back on funding anything like that um, anything that works towards community essentially I would say um, uh, I studied 
I studied my A-levels twice, it didn't work the first time, I had something like a mental breakdown, I had a mental breakdown again, as I'm looking at here, um, when I studied sound engineering at a time when um, <laughs> sound engineering was kind of, it was very soon not a, not a career as it once was, a lot of people now can kind of record their own stuff in their bedrooms with a few kind of um, cheap technological tools. Um, and hardware and the like. Um, and also, interestingly, kind of, as I've moved through kind of education and, and these other things, um, which is kind of what my generation was, was expected to do, um, I saw, for example, when I worked, um, when, I, when I studied sound engineering, it was in a college um, whose um, what do you call it, the, the place, <laughs> the, uh, the, the college kind of campus was, uh, was a former um, car factory uh, in the black country. And um, then later on when I studied at uh, Nottingham, then uh, there was a new campus opening which had formerly been uh, the Raleigh factory. So Raleigh, I don't think, it, well, it doesn't exist anymore, hasn't existed for maybe 15 uh, getting on for 20 years, um, and that was somewhere that the writer, kind of Alan Silito, who come from, from Nottingham, uh, when there were still kind of working class writers, uh, which pretty much the, the kind of aren't anymore, you know, the, the, the way to develop as a writer is very different now than it was at that time. Um, the Rally Factory then closed down, um, and Alan Silito experienced the Rally Factory at the time, I guess from the 50s, when he was first kind of becoming known, uh, he experienced it as somewhere that you could earn a decent living uh, by doing semi-skilled work, um, and that kind of those kind of jobs have really not not existed for some time now. Um, and then I worked, I worked as a chef. I retrained as a chef. Um, I did that, and uh, in all of these jobs, then I couldn't find a way to exist and to. I couldn't find a comfortable way to exist. I was I was very marginal and um, I was struggling to pay the bills. I couldn't say the number of places where I've lived. Uh, I, I moved house regularly, often living in, for example, I was, I, was, I worked in a youth hostel uh, before it was closed down. That was closed down as well uh, in the first year that I was there. So I, I moved to Wales and I worked in a youth hostel. And, um, and lived there as well. So I was working in these jobs where you live you have digs uh, with where you live. I, I lived then in the uh, National Mountain Centre for a time. Um, I lived in the digs there for a good few months uh, and then moved again. I don't know how many places I've lived in. I lived in a um, centre for Bud a Buddhist meditation centre in Clandidna. And um, that was the last place I lived actually in Britain. Um, and all of these places, they, they, they eat up most of your money essentially when you're kind of renting a place. Um, and yet you still kind of live with others and you live kind of insecurely and um, in every way it's possible to live insecurely. So kind of like, you know, your stuff can get robbed. Uh, you kind of, um, you live and mix with others. You don't have any privacy, things like that. Um, and you don't feel settled or secure. So that's my experience as somebody who, despite having all of these problems that I had, um, was privileged in other ways of being kind of like straight, white, male. Um, and coming from a family that was kind of doing okay socially. Um, but now I'm looking back and I'm seeing that I have a lot of student debt. Um, I'm able to live here, I'm able to have this place as well because essentially my my girlfriend is, is financially more independent and uh, her, her family has earned a lot of money. Um, one way or another by, by working very hard um, but that's why I'm able to have the life that I have now and, and I'm able to take some time to try to try to think about these things and try to develop some things for myself. Um, I see that in Britain right now they're, they're talking about or, or, or a think tank recently has, um, has mentioned the idea of giving £10,000 to uh, millennials uh, to try to help them either to start their own business or to, uh, to find a place or something like that and um, honestly that's 
even if they did it, which I don't think they will, um, it's it's kind of a lot of people in the, in the situation that I am of being marginal. And some people have a lot worse. So when I was first being diagnosed with ADHD, then it was um, it was it was difficult because they expected people who have ADHD to have problems with uh, with the law, uh, with um, having had I know, car crashes and whatever else, and all of these things, and catastrophic life events that should surely impact people who have ADHD, and then it helps with diagnosis actually if they have had these problems. So. Um, that shows that there are a lot of people who who have had it worse, um, but it's been a struggle all of that time, and that's part of what the uh, the first issue of Mike and Ali uh, will be about, and it's also part of what Mike and Ali will be about um, uh, in general. And um, Mike and Ali, I haven't kind of um, in any. I haven't explained exactly what I want from it, but. I'm trying to show that it's possible to have these kind of communitarian zines that are published and self-hosted by um, small communities of people whose voices don't typically get heard. So not everything that, that is kind of um, published in Marginali will be published on, on my version of, of, of Marginali. If it all goes right, there'll be other people setting up other such zines and using these tools to to kind of get their own voice out there. Um, and that's what I hope from the project in general. Uh, I'm a little unsettled at the moment because there are so many worries that I have about trying to make this pay. Um, and I don't know when and if people will ever donate to, to what I'm doing. Um, you can go to the donations page at marginalia.eu backslash subs, uh, where you can kind of um, donate to what I'm trying to do. Um, using LibraPay, using kind of PayPal, using Bitcoin if you like, or um, what else do I have? Um, Patreon. Uh, and you can try to give me money to, to, to try to help me get this going. Um, but I wanted to try to, to summarize um, part of what it's all about, because I haven't done it in a very kind of um, accessible way in a short video yet, so I hope that that's what this is about. Um, the essay that I'm taking on then is kind of looking over all of that stuff and being marginal in, in, in my life. And um, I guess I want to ask the question, well, what could I have done differently? How could I have worked harder or worked in a more clever way that would have been ethical, that would have worked for the community, not against it? Um, where I could have earned money, you know, I could have gone on from, you know, it, it was a struggle actually once I got the, the, the degree. Um, the, the assumption about kind of the, the student loans policy and things like that is that um, you get the degree, then you get a good job. So I don't know, did they expect me to work in a, in a, in a, in a management consulting or kind of in a bank or whatever? Because it was hard enough to get into something like journalism. At a time that journalism was collapsing, absolutely, but it was also becoming professionalized in a way that previously it hadn't been. The, uh, the, the retired journalist who taught me at um, Sandwell College when I was studying sound engineering with, with media studies and stuff like that, um, he had started at the age of 14, maybe 16, something like that, and just worked his way up um, on maybe a local newspaper or something like that. And by the time that I was coming out of university, that was much more difficult. And uh, the expectation was that you would work for free um, for a period in London, which was not possible, um, before getting a job somewhere. And um, then a lot of the time, you wouldn't be writing journalism that actually mattered. You would be writing kind of pass notes for the Guardian or something like that, just being kind of sarcastic about, about some of the cultural things that are going on and you're not writing anything that's ever going to um, kind of hold power to account or, or do the things that journalism should do. Um, and it was just much harder to get into. So I consequently didn't manage to do that and I've been shifting around doing different jobs all the time since. Um, and that's what I'm taking on in the current essay. So I'm trying to do some videos alongside that because right now it's hard to focus is the thing I'm kind of, even 
with you know, I'm, I'm trying all I can. I mean, in the last twenty years, I've done all I can as well to, to kind of heal myself um, from these kind of conditions that I have to um, to concentrate. All of the things that I've learned about how to to improve my conditions in terms of ADHD, in terms of depression, and things like that, have been related to food, um, not eating the kind of um, highly pro pro processed, very chemical, loads of additives and all of these things that kind of um, that we can eat when we are economically marginal um, make my condition much worse that I can't think at all um, and can't function. So being able to function means having the food and having the time and having the discipline um, is kind of a full-time job to try and keep myself um, healthy uh, because really the default is to, to eat Stuff that isn't food at all. It's, it's kind of what Michael Pollan calls, I think, um, edible non-food items. That's what we're supposed to eat. You go down to Tesco and you buy the, the economics, um, the, 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 the kind of low-cost products, and you're putting a lot of anti-nutrients into your body, which if you are kind of in any way um, physiologically vulnerable to, to, to these things and, and are unable to process them as a certain percentage of people certainly are, then you don't function as you have depression and you have kind of ADHD, you have all of these things. So that's my understanding right now of many of these neurodevelopmental, neurodevelopmental conditions. And when I worked with those kids um, who were from 16 to 20 something, and uh, everybody will know somebody who has ADHD, who has all of these conditions, and people will say, well, people didn't have these conditions in the trenches. Um, they kind of did, and uh, the people who had them maybe died earlier and stuff like that, so uh, in some ways there's been some advance. But also, these are civilizational diseases, all right, and uh, we don't adequately um, take them on board. Um, so I've tried again, I've, I've tried everything that I could, and I would be very happy if somebody could tell me what I, what I didn't do that I should have done and should have known about um, in order to improve these conditions to make myself more functional and more able to earn money. Um, but that's one of the conversations that I want to try to start um, with Brian Um What are we supposed to do? All right, so, uh, you know, you'd have me working as, um, again, you're just breaking down community by working for these banks that have absolutely failed, um, these management consulting firms that have just gone in and just said, hey, just lay off half of your staff and you'll be saving money, you'll be more efficient. Um, and all of the economic structures that have been built up since Margaret Thatcher's time have been really awful for anybody who is not within the elites. Um, and not only for myself, but those of um, the, the children of the Will Windrush generation, people who are um, because of racism, because of kind of sexism, because whatever it is, um, have been more marginal even than I was myself. And I want to start that conversation because um, these people are going to try and fight me now. The, uh, the, the bureaucracy will come down hard on me because I have been evading my responsibilities. They, they, they write me emails about evasion, um, but actually I've just not been able to keep up with any of this stuff. Um, and I've been trying to keep myself alive and trying to keep myself functional. And a lot of the time it hasn't been working. Um, so that's one of the conversations that I want to have. And now that I'm a little bit more functional because I spend so much time, you know, I come home and then I've got to cook for the next day. And um, for my girlfriend, it's like different, different because a lot of these these foods and these kind of like, um, they're, they're not only kind of, um, what do you call them? Uh, the additives in these foods that we have. Um, because of Monsanto, because of all of the, 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 the companies that are filling our products with kind of, uh, with crap, with, with, with chemical kind of, um, additives all of the time, which is what we've grown up with. Um, uh, they are neurotoxins, but also they're just toxins in general. So for my girlfriend, I've been eczema if she doesn't eat right. Um, 
And ten people look at us from the from the younger generation and they and they say, Oh my god, this generation is so useless. You know, people talk about millennials all the time and how we're unable to hold down jobs and unable to keep our bloody houses tiny and I don't know what else we are expected to do. We're being put in a, a box by the generation above us who simply don't understand us and, and prefer to look at us and go, Oh my god, these guys are so unfunctional. There's a lot of reasons for that. And uh, I'm feeling it now from, from, from her family, this kind of uh, expectation and kind of like this, this disappointment in our inability to, to function on, on what is considered to be a basic level um, of our, our inability to, um, to settle down and have children and, and, and build a kind of nice, tidy, bourgeois life for ourselves. But um, it's not only because these values just don't, um, don't get us excited as they might. Um, we kind of feel that really we want to f we want to we want to feel a community around us. We want to feel embedded in a community. We want to feel part of a community, and that just doesn't exist for us. Um, and um, so I want to start that conversation. That's part of what I'm trying to do here. And um, I hope to make some more videos about that. I hope to kind of talk to my parents about their experiences growing up in the 1960s um, and, and see what those differences are and try to try to build up kind of intergenerational um, conversation uh, because frankly it's, it's not um, it's not like parents who are, who are destroying the world that they kind of <laughs> they did vote for Thatcher um, again they grew up in a, in a time when there were a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of industrial unrest in the 70s in, in, in Great Britain and so they thought that Thatcher was the answer I don't think that it was um, I, I very strongly feel that it was um, but try to explain to them, well, why is it that we find it so difficult? Why is it that it, it has been so difficult for us? Um, why is it that we're not functioning in the way that they expect? And um, why is it that we think that this 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 older generation that that's just they're destroying this planet, they're destroying kind of community, um, and now we have. The, the, the younger elites um, have also helped to do many of those things, so they've bought into it entirely. And those, those of our generation who have bought into the old kind of uh, economic orthodoxies of, of Thatcher and Reagan and neoliberalism and all the rest of it, and have set up firms like Facebook and have been accepted by, um, by our parents' generation, have also very much helped to to destroy the planet, to destroy community, to to to, to make um, pervasive uh, mass surveillance the norm, uh, and to to lead people towards pretty kind of fascistic and hateful um, interactions, which again has become the norm over the last, uh, I guess, ten years of Facebook and social media and the like. Um, and that's what we're seeing now. So now that we're going to see a kind of like uh, an, an exacerbation of all of the tensions in the world under Donald Trump, um, who has been delivered by not only these economic policies, but also by these kind of divisive um, technological tools and creations, all of which are centralized, all of which are, are kind of um, They, they, they use this pervasive surveillance and the like, and um, it's really not the way forward, and that's that's what we want to talk about as well. So we want to develop some kind of open means of, of communication that are based and, and embedded in community, and uh, it's difficult to find that. So I'm trying to find that, and that's what I'm trying to build here. I'm trying to build that by, by finding alternatives to social media, asking whether social media of any kind, whether it's whether it's federated as, as my instance of Pleroma is federated um, at ppp.marginalia.eu if you look there um, and I'm talking about kind of Mastodon and these, these alternatives to kind of uh, Twitter and to Facebook and all of these all of these things and whether it is actually an improvement or actually whether um, really we need to be getting out to the physical space and trying to, trying to communicate with one another. I think that there's a kind of there's a balance there somehow that we can all find um, and I'm, I'm trying to find it myself. Um, that's what the, the dialogue is about, and also just trying to, to, to create kind of like horizontal means of communication um, 
which might be embedded in communities here in Prague, for example, where I currently live um, in Britain, but also between these different kind of communities, hopefully, um, each of which will be embedded in their own community, uh, kind of community. Um, it's an idea of, I guess, subsidiarity, which I guess in, in, in the European institutional terms is often interpreted not very well, as many of the, the things in Europe so far have not been interpreted very well on an institutional level. Um, and that kind of derives from Catholicism, I think, initially, kind of the idea of subsidiarity in Europe. Um, but I, I'm trying to make some of those conversations happen, first of all, so that people are embedded in their own communities, but then so that these communities can talk to one another um, without resorting to Facebook and these kind of centralized um, tools um, that haven't been doing so well in terms of building any kind of constructive way of, of talking um, between people. Um, and I'm going against the idea of that we all should be some kind of rationally, what do they call it, um, the round corporation and, and, and people like this, if you look at the uh, the documentaries of, I was calling him Nick Kershaw, I'm not sure he's called Nick Kershaw. Um, <laughs> I, will, I will post the real link later on, but if you look at that, it goes back to the round corporation and, and a lot of people um, in America, these kind of classical economists, they call them, where we all should behave as rationally self-maximizing individuals. Thatcher, she's often kind of misquoted, but nevertheless, I think the, the under, underlying kind of um, underlying philosophy of Thatcher was that um, there is no such thing as society, only, only individuals and their families. And I think that is a very dangerous idea and has been proven to be so over and over again, even before you start breaking down community and breaking down anything that is, that is working towards it by looking at kind of, um, trying to build that age of austerity, which was David Cameron's terms. And, uh, underlying all of this is that there is no future in England's dreaming still, um, these many years after, after punk in all of its, all of its, constructive and less constructive kind of forms. Um, and um, these people have fucked the world that we live in. That's what I want to talk about. So I'm going to try and do that here and settle into this writing again. I've had broken routines over the last few few days and weeks, and so it's difficult to get back into it. And uh, all in my head is all of these negative expectations of the people around me who, who just think that I'm not, I should be working in a firm, and kind of like working for Microsoft or Google or something like this. And uh, I don't think that's what I should be doing because I don't think that that's actually um, done us any favours. So that's not my uh, my favourite solution. This is my favourite solution, and I want to try and get the get the idea of that across um, in some of these videos and in what I'll be doing for my Ali. So for now, thank you, and uh, and, and that's it for the moment.